Hey guys, welcome to the 16th episode of the Learning Podcast. And if you're not sure, it's a Singaporean podcast dedicated to learning something new from every single guest on this show. And today I have with me a friend I met through LinkedIn, Renee. Yes. Renee, right? Renee. Renee is actually a content strategist. She edits video herself. And I think if you're interested in topics such as financial planning, content strategy production or even video editing or even you would say perhaps slightly in the entertainment industry yeah. like you worked at Walt Disney right so yes. I think there's a whole suite of experience that you offer such as working in China News Asia which I'm very interested by mm-hmm. so I think there's a lot of value if you are interested in content production in general and which I'm very interested in because I want to learn how all these big companies do it and how perhaps people like small fries like me go about doing content production. So uh, Renee, for those listeners that don't know who you are, could you give a quick introduction of who you are and what you're currently doing? Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Renee. I am a content strategist at Policy Pal. I just started. Um, I am 23 years old. I'm going to be 24 okay, next okay. month. <laughs> and then um, basically my background is in English literature and film studies, mm. but I am currently doing more marketing related stuff mm. right now. Yeah. So from the start, right, why did you apply to NUS to study English literature and film studies? Like, was it together at the same time or did you enroll both in one? Um, the film studies is a minor, oh. so it's like an add on thing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, how did I start? Um, when I was young, let's just start at the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. When I was really young, I was quite illiterate. I couldn't read until I was um, probably like six or seven. So, I was a really, really slow learner. Okay. And I've always been told like, oh, I'm kind of stupid. You know, I've learned very, very slow. So, I always had that in mind. And then, like the first experience I had was that I was bringing back a storybook. And then my mom, I asked my mom, um, oh, I, I don't understand when my teacher said read between the lines. Mm. And then she was like, oh, you just really need to understand. It, you no, know? so I liter I literally took the book and I just went like, Mother, there's helpful. nothing, there's nothing between the lines. What uh. are you saying? So, so that was the beginning, and but I was always very interested in storytelling, and I think fundamentally that's what everybody wants to do, like be a very engaging storyteller for marketers at yes. least. Yeah, so that was like my start in into English literature as a storytelling medium mm. books. So since secondary school, I did English literature. JC also did English literature. And uni, I also did English literature. Mm. So I never strayed from what I wanted to do. Like mm. I knew I always wanted to do this. I wasn't in a mindset where I want this as a job, mm. you know? And I think a lot of people, they, they do go into uni. It's like, okay, this is like the highest paying job I can possibly get. Or, yeah, was me, was yeah, me. yeah, like that's the <laughs> idea, right? And there's nothing wrong with that per se if there isn't something you're super, super passionate about mm. at that point in time. So you should just do that. But for me, it's like, I really just wanted to do this so obviously when it ended right then it, it felt like I was at the edge of a cliff you know I was like oh my goodness what now like like imagine it ended at the end of university yeah so because like four years secondary school two years JC four years mm. um, uni right that's literally 10 years of my life that yeah. was half my life yeah. like being very passionate about English mm. literature and and so when I was in um, I'll talk about a bit more about how my, did video production come in yeah yeah, yeah exactly that's part of storytelling right correct, part of English correct. literature yeah, yeah yeah so um, how that happened was that initially uh, when I joined uni, obviously I must think long term. I was thinking, what kind of job am I going to get? Mm. So um, in the beginning, I was just um, I, I was thinking of journalism, like writing related stuff. Mm. But I, as I saw the journalism landscape change so rapidly, everything moving to media and online content, all mm. that, I realized that I was entering a like a dying industry. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean dying industry? Is it true internships? I'm really interested no, no. to hear your industry experience. No, no, what, what made you arrive at this conclusion that this was a dying industry that you print, didn't want to be part? Oh, really? Print. 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 Yeah. I don't think writing is dead. Why do you think writing is no, dead? No, no, no. I mean, print. The print, oh, print. industry is okay. dead. Okay. And and I grew up in the environment, you know, mm. like the magazines. I would I would collect all my magazines. Oh. I would like read the newspaper, like oh, that okay, print. Okay. I was oh, always okay. very excited about I print see, and see. books, like physical books. Yeah. I like feeling things. I like touching things. Mm. You know. So that sounds weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but like I like the physicality of of those things mm. and and so that's why um when i was like year one year two i was like okay th- it, the industry is kind of dying like the print industry is dying so i didn't want to come out and enter a dying industry that would be very difficult yes. for me to sustain so i was starting to rethink what can i possibly do so mm. my first internship was working at a uh, it's called potato productions but actually the smaller company under that was compass loft so mm. it's an education tech startup okay yeah and i did a whole bunch of random things like social media related stuff mm. i planned facebook content mm. i did two video series i wrote featured articles on other startup creators 
and Wait, like, so so you learned all the hard skills then and there like yeah video production. just there like specifically the video production what kind of series did you guys do like covering stories of the customers mm, no 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 um it was very interesting because they just let us do whatever we wanted so one of the video series was uh like the hit the streets thing you know like how mothership oh does yes it right yes now. i think that's a very nice and easy topic to do yeah, like street interviews i was doing i was doing that okay. yeah and it was with the topics of like oh you know pokemon go was just mm. released mm. how do you think it will revolutionize uh, like the oh, tech environment do you have those videos oh my god i don't even know where it is now by somewhere out there right I, okay, um, okay I'll, I'll link it somewhere. I'll link if, it somewhere. If we have, if there is. So you were the somewhere. one shooting or conducting the street interview? I was conducting the street interview. Oh. But I was also one of the producers. So there's like three. They, they name all of us as producers okay. because we would script it, we would plan the questions. Oh. And then we I would have a camera person follow me. So it's oh. just two of us that just goes there and asks people. Because things. personally, I've did a little bit of street interviews, right? And it's actually. It's so hard. Yeah, it's so hard, right? It's so cringy also. <laughs> Do you have any uh, tips on how to conduct a good street, uh, street interview? I think um, just it's easy to create, and I think like it's a good form of content creation as well. But what are the kind of tips would you give? I think you just need to be very confident when you're approaching people, and just say like if you don't feel comfortable with this, like it won't be released. Okay, that kind okay. of thing. Just yeah. But like, do you have to ask them to sign an NDA for all this kind of stuff? Back then, no. Back then, but right. now, but now you yeah, have now to. you do. Now you do. Have so to. everyone who, like who gets interviewed on mothership. Or all those they have to sign NDA. I'm sure they would have to right now. Okay, right? I'm not yeah. sure actually. Given the environment that it is, because people are very sensitive about these things. So going back to your internship in this company, yeah. How how is it like, in general? Because it seems like you have been given so much freedom. Mm-hmm. Mm. So oh, okay. So that was one of the video series, and we thought it was a good way to educate people, like you know the normal people that didn't understand what was AI, IoT, mm. machine learning, all that. And I was learning along the way also because I have to do research on that before uh. I go and ask people stuff. Uh. So I would always uh, try to frame it in a sense that I ask them a question about, oh, how do you think artificial intelligence? What kind of jobs will artificial intelligence bring? Mm. You know, and then people have no idea. And now I'll, I'll throw in some fun facts along the way mm. to explain to people. Oh, okay, this is like some like oh. interesting thing about it. Then you see their reactions is yeah it? they're like oh I didn't know that and I was oh. like oh you know a starting pay is this high and all oh. that and they're just like oh my goodness I need to go into tech now <laughs> yeah so it was it was very interesting then the second video series was more entertainment education mm. so it's like we will do little skits and then mm. we'll put along the way like oh okay now you can use an app to paint the walls you know mm. like change the walls orange and then you can just scan through and see what your house will look like if mm. it's orange right mm. yeah so that was another another series so th- those were like concurrent mm. and we were planning it together so this was your first foray into marketing Ye- social media marketing social yeah, media marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. So moving on like, do you go to Channel News Asia after that like uh, how, how did how did things pan out after that what did I do after that I, do, I don't remember okay, let okay. me go and double check okay okay sure <laughs> in terms of okay can we talk about your time in CNA okay like, how, was, is it easy to get in the CNA um okay wait, wait I need to talk about before that now okay, I remember okay, happened, yeah, okay let's, let's reverse a bit uh, uh so going chronologically right so the NUS English lit thing was happening and then that was when I started to after that experience in uh, that company like the startup company I was like I want to take this more seriously like mm. video uh, content creation mm. at least on video more seriously so I entered new studios which is uh, NUS film studies oh. uh, not a film studies film school oh yes 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 I, I know some friends there actually yeah, yeah 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 so it was really a very very fun experience and, and I was directing some stuff like short films mm. yeah some of the short films got showcased to like wherever and whatever. If I'm not wrong, like NUS does provide a certain budget for you to yes. like get actors. It will give you nice equipments, like decent equipment, decent <laughs> equipments, lighting gear and everything. I know some friends then they have made like really really nice. I actually mm. went to one of the uh, film previews and I wow the kind of films they produce is really at an, another level. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm still really proud of like the the stuff that I did. One mm. my first short film was called The Eulogy, and and so it's online, right? Okay, I'll link yeah, it. Yeah. I'll link it up. Okay, okay. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So. I, so I started just doing it for fun, right? Yeah. There's no... Like, I mean, it all starts from there. Yeah, uni is just for fun. Just explore and do whatever you want to do. So I did that. And then I had uh, I got an interview with Channel News Asia. And it was... They either they gave me an option. Either journalism or um, video content creation. So mm. they said, okay, choose one. So I said, uh, I would like to explore more of video content creation. Mm. And so that's how I got the opportunity to work at CNA Insider. Mm. Yeah. So when you just joined CN, uh, CNA, mm-hmm. uh, was the CNA Insider series already ongoing or it was something ongoing else? Really, ongoing, Ongoing. Yeah. So how were you onboarded into that process? Do they outsource it to an external agency to shoot or you guys shoot it, produce it, script it? 
Oh, okay, so there's two kinds of content. One is originals, and then the others are like documentary short yeah. forms. So mainly, what I was doing is assisting some of their original productions, mm. and as well as. But my main bulk of my work is to cut the you know one hour documentaries to mm. like like right. two social, three minutes. Social media. Yeah, social media digestible oh. uh, sizes. Mm. Um, one, yeah, one hour documentary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to two minutes. Yeah, yeah, but wow. but in that one hour usually it's two to three profiles ah, so oh, okay, you would choose okay. ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. From that one hour, you can ch- do you churn multiple pieces of content from it or just one? Uh, okay. If so, if there are three profiles on the one hour documentary, you can choose like one of them or you can so choose what, two what of them. So what profile like uh individual story is it? Yeah, individual stories. There's a series where uh they were going through career coaches. So one mm. of the interesting. Was it one of the interesting profiles, right? Is that this career coach was uh, coaching this boy with Down syndrome to work in Uniqlo. Mm. So in the whole series, right? Okay, that one the whole one hour is just him. Yeah. So that so in that sense, you find like certain components of that one hour documentary, and then you cut it down. Mm. Okay, and then another one that was my favorite one, a one hour documentary on animals. So you would have different caregivers. So like people, this guy from SPCA, uh, this lady that was uh, helping. Uh, animals with hydrotherapy mm. and etc so these are all people that work with animals so mm. so, so for every one hour um, documentary there is a main topic right mm. yeah so so for example let's say the animals one i can say uh, i want to choose this one profile the one with the hydrotherapy uh, with dogs mm. yeah and then my boss can say okay i'll uh, do the spca one okay. so I, I can do both la, essentially yeah, mm. yeah, yeah how long does it take for you to edit a piece of content out from this one hour documentary um it's like a week or less. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Then what's the like? Is it are they very thorough in general in, when it comes to you releasing content on social media? Like what? What, what do you are mean? the what's the approval process like? Like how's the how's the structure or hierarchy like when it comes to approving content to be posted on CNA? It's quite fast because there's one supervisor only. So um, essentially, you would choose a she or I would choose a profile, mm. and then I would script it. Mm. So like video, audio, video, audio, and then it will be around two pages. So mm. once once I finish scripting it, I will send it to her, and then she will approve or edit again. So that that process will be very fast, around like one or two days. Scripting it as in scripting it from the original documentary. Yeah. So you so I would have to watch those and then like get all the rushes and mm. all those right and so then what's rush- what rushes? rushes are like the raw the raw form of oh, what okay, is okay. like unedited oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. so I would watch all those and either frame it in a sense that has already been framed in the documentary or, or take a news direction to it because obviously a one hour uh, let's say a 20 minute feature right there's actually a ton of content yes. right, that doesn't actually get it mm. so it's really up to the people working at CNA Insider to think about whether you want to go with the same angle or whether you want to go with a different angle that mm. the documentary didn't take mm. Yeah, so in that sense, the actually the process is very fast. So you'll have it like uh, one, one, two days of approval. And then after that, you'll have another like one, two days of editing. So if mm. Monday, uh, we decided on a profile, by Friday, you can be out already. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of working in a big media organization like Channel News Asia, right? Were there any challenges that you faced? Definitely, because while, uh, while working with my supervisor can be very fast and very efficient, right? Working with the other departments, like let's say the main producers of the documentary, right, can be very challenging mm. because they might not be there themselves. So when mm. you're trying to get like the rushes or the, the unedited footage from them, you can't find them and they mm. disappear to don't know where. And the thing about hot desking is that nobody is anywhere. Mm. I hate it. Oh my goodness. Oh. I hate hot desking. It's the worst mm. idea. So hot desk. People hot desk in CNA. Yeah, like yeah, the yeah. Different departments hot desk. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they Is it like just a, a lot of tables and people just sit anywhere they want? Yeah, correct. So it's like maybe one moment you're sitting here, right? Then the oh. next moment, uh, next day I'm trying to look for you, right? You're oh. not there anymore. Oh, okay. I'm just like, how am I, I supposed it. to find you? Oh, so you everything's know? done through emails, lah. Yeah, emails and but you also need to find people like physically get like the, so the, the copies. So the production from them. team they have the raw clips and everything. Is yeah, it? They, they are the ones that go out to shoot everything yes yes so the post-production and the like the filming itself is like two different uh, departments y- as in it's you, so you are the one that's doing mainly the post-editing yeah oh. correct correct but but we there are other people in the team right the 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 because I was intern right for the full timers they they were in charge of originals also so that's where they would go out get the stories mm. and interview people shoot the thing edit mm. the thing mm. and sometimes write an article as well so mm. the full timers have a bit more of that responsibility but for interns we would mainly just help them uh like 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 do a transcript mm. you know go through the whole interview write out everything oh. and and like basic stuff like that so and also like assist on any originals that they need like you know take oh. photos or whatever for their articles mm. yeah do you have any other crazy story from cna like okay at least uh for listeners out there i have some friends who used to work in cna mm. they say that the burnout in the media industry is really real right 
can you just share a little bit more about that? Because I myself wasn't. I mean, I'm not involved in the media landscape, so yeah. But a lot of people talk about burnout really, really fast. Is it because of the like the tight deadlines? Like, oh, by this date, something needs to go out, or what other factors are contributing to this fast turnaround in such an industry? I think I'm very fortunate in the sense that when I was in Channel News Asia, it wasn't as crazy as it could possibly be because I have other people in journalism like you know SBH and all that uh. so the burnout is also very high there it's the thing about being in news you know like if there's a fire that happens right now in uh, Pongo or something you need to just go or yeah. if it's in the middle of the night like 11pm you need to just leap out from your bed and just, and just go write something. yeah yeah so yeah. it's in that sense it can be very you are you're stuck to your phone in a very sad kind of way and you have to cancel plans, everything. You you feel very detached from the rest of like the world also because you're constantly having to be on demand. Do you mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, so that is the I mean. Oh, it's, so it's not like the working environment. It's more of you being on your toes. I mean, the working environment is, is another thing, but uh. that that is one of the things that, mm. that may, most people would talk about. Mm. Of course, uh, the working environment, right, it's, it's very numbers-based as is any other like marketing-related stuff. Like, oh, how, how successful is our campaign? Or, or like if, for example, like a video, right? Okay, like your, this video got 100,000 views, but your previous video had 2 million views. So why, why, so why did it do worse? So there's Okay, what did we do in the 2 million videos that we can uh, emulate, is it? Then there's a yeah, lot no, of but it's, the, it's so harsh. Like, it's very, very it's harsh. harsh. Because you won't ever get compliments for, let's say you did something so, a campaign so successfully, right? Two million, you know, like uh. people, a lot of people watch, a lot of people, high engagement, everything, uh. right? You have nothing, you have no positive reinforcement at all. You will oh. just be reminded that it could have been better, you know, the audio wasn't great. Just oh, <laughs> that's hypercritical. Huh? Yeah, it is. And it, and it can be very harsh for people that are first time into it and they don't really know what they're doing. Mm. So in that sense, if you can take criticism extremely well and you have no soul, right? Uh, <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no, but right, the burnout is really very bad. Like mm. it, it's mainly because of the, the negative reinforcement and, mm. and that's why people, they don't feel very valued because you don't give them the positives with the negatives. Mm. Yeah, so that's why, that's why CNA, one thing is that you have incredibly long hours and uh, media corp in general, you have incredibly long hours, you have very little reward for what you're doing. So that's why people burn out, you know, because like, when I'm talking to other other of my friends in different industries that burn out, let's say finance or the chemicals industry, and they burn out, they're so exhausted, they're so tired. But then you see them so motivated. I'm just like, why? Eh? Oh. Like I was also a bit crazy, you know, what? Yeah. Then they say, oh, because I'm being rewarded for my work. Like oh. they have a high, they have high pay B- bonuses, all these incentives. Correct. They have high pay. They, their their managers train them very oh. well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Oh. In that sense, you can get why they are still doing what they are doing because they are being rewarded for their work financially. Mm. That's one mm. thing. Yeah. So, so in the media space, this is absent. Yeah, like you are you are working long hours for very little pay. Essentially, oh. that's why it is. Yeah. What's the average turnover duration of a particular uh, staff at CNA? I mean, just in from your general country when you were intern there. I wouldn't know, but like I briefly talked about like the HR. They said after the bonus comes in, then most people just leave. Just one year or like. Uh, it, it, varies. it varies. Yeah, yeah. But usually the people that are still there right now, they have been there for a very, very long time. Like mm. there's like 10 years or more. Mm. And then I think I know a couple of people that are still there. It's been around two years. Mm. Yeah. So if, so I think if that environment is really for you and you can really take criticism very, very well, right, mm. then it will be okay. But you just won't get any positive encouragement. Uh. So the that. only positive encouragement you get is from yourself. Like, oh, yeah, you'll be like, I'm doing a good job. Like, uh. and, and in fact, you know how like YouTubers or whatever, they burn out because they read very negative comments. Yeah, right? yeah. But actually, it's the opposite. You know, when I was in CNA, I would, whenever I felt very, very like down, right, I would always read the comments because I'm so inspired. They're oh. like, this is such good work you're doing. Like, thanks for all this yeah, information. Yeah, that's where the positive uh, reinforcement yeah, comes from. It, it comes from like outside like, where uh. you know that your work is important. You know mm. that this is good uh, content that you're creating. Mm. But you, you'll get that not at your well, you'll get that like somewhere else, yeah. So would it be right to say that your experience in CNA decided that this was an industry that you wasn't too keen on? Um, I didn't exactly want to completely burn bridges mm. also because the media industry is very small. Mm. So um, if you, you want to go and burn the bridge with the largest company in oh. the oh, largest in company Singapore, in Singapore, then that would be very challenging for you to want to go oh. into media again, right? Mm. And I'm not completely averse to the idea either. Mm. It's just that maybe that particular environment at that particular pace is not for me. Mm. Yeah, so I was looking at, when I graduated, I was looking at joining the media industry or like video mm. production related mm. because I still did want to do something like that. Video related. Yeah, video related. Mm. So I just think that 
that for people that want to do it, they just need to have a very, very, very thick skin and thick to survive. Skin. So that's yeah. a number one trait you have to need. You need to be to, to go into the media space. Yeah, general. don't take things personally. That's don't, but it's very, very difficult. Are there any more tidbits for people that might be interested in this industry? Um, I would say just try and and because because I don't regret like mm. any of the internships I've done mm. because it. That you learn very invaluable things that you wouldn't have otherwise, right? Mm. And and when I was in Channel News Asia, I didn't know how to use Premiere Pro, so they literally threw me to the sharks. Oh, so they they use Premiere Pro. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So so they really threw me to the sharks. You know, they were. What just were you like, using before? I was not using anything. I was never an editor. Oh, okay. So it was your first time editing in yes, CNA. That's yes. cool. Like you pick, it forces you to pick up a skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I just get paid for it. Okay, but <laughs> yeah. maybe not in a very nice environment. But internships are, yeah, yeah. It's it's just a room for you to grow, like If you are. Yeah. If you are in uni, I would say just do a ton of internships. It doesn't matter. Don't think too much about it. Don't think is this related to what I want to do or not uh. related. Just just do it. You know, you will definitely get something out of it mm. to help your career in the future. Mm. Yeah. So after that, I mean, before graduation, you still did a series of internships, right? And yeah. I, I think you went to what Walt America. Like yeah, Walt, Walt Disney World. How did that happen? Oh, okay. Because NUS has a program with Walt Disney World, so they send around. Do they? I yeah, never they know. Do. Shit. <laughs> what, program is this? what program is this? <laughs> uh, it's, it's yeah, it's a it's a summer internship, Walt Disney World summer internship oh. with NUS as well as um. Uh, well, where were my friends from? Uh, NTU. Mm. So you have NUS and NTU. So um, the university will select like ten. It was a summer program. Yeah, summer oh. program. So, but I'm very YOLO uh, because I already graduated when I did the summer program. Ah. Like, was it your first time going to United States? Uh, to yes, work? yes, yes, yes. How was it like there? Oh, wow, I learned a lot. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. Let me tell you how I got it. Okay, so, so NUS, they were sent 10. NTU, they were sent 10. I'm not sure right now how oh. many, but um, they will be, they will allocate you into different uh, departments. So some people would be doing entertainment. Like I was in the entertainment department. And then, so it's, I was a character attendant. Then there are also character performers. Oh. And there are also other people like ride attendants. So what is a character attendant? Oh, so a character attendant is someone that brings out the character. So like, you know, Mickey Mouse oh. or Elsa and, oh. and all that. Like I'm the one, I'm, I'm basically a security <laughs> like oh, okay, a security okay, okay. force as well like as a storyteller also, uh. which is something I really like because characters they can't talk yes, so yes, yes. when they do certain gestures you, you must animate as in they are animating and uh. people don't understand what they're trying to do oh. so I will translate that in a sense yeah. that's cool yeah, so if like Mickey Mouse is like pointing at this and like that right then uh. then people then he will just be like what you but, must but, put some words yeah so it. I will say oh Mickey loves your shirt like it, uh. it looks amazing yeah uh. so stuff like that and, and I got to see so many amazing things like I saw a proposal I saw oh. like a babe, like gender review uh. like it's so magical like really it's is that Disneyland Disneyland right Disney World yeah, Disney yeah. World. in Orlando yeah is it like is it like the Disney that is, that is as big as Singapore there's, there's a Disneyland in Singapore. No, no, it's a. Because <laughs> I think there's like a Disneyland which is like damn huge. Like, how, how huge? Oh, you is mean it? a Shanghai one? Is it? No, as in like the size of Disneyland's in. Or how, how big is it? How big is the park? How big is the park? Okay, there are four parks actually in Walt oh. Disney World. Oh. There is Animal Kingdom, Epcot, oh. um, Magic Kingdom, oh. as well as. Uh, Animal Kingdom, Epcot, Magic Kingdom, and Hollywood Studios, so four. Mm. Okay. So there are four parks, and I was specifically working at Epcot. Mm. So if you want to combine all these parks together in terms of the land size, right, it is the biggest um, like Disney Disney oh. World that is in the world. But if you want to talk about which is the biggest Disneyland in the whole world, it's uh. Shanghai. Oh, Shanghai? Yeah, in terms of land space, oh, okay, simply because it's gigantic, but mm. the attractions are kind of the same. Mm. I just came back from Shanghai like last month. Oh. Yeah. How were you onboarded? Like the whole process, I'm sure you had to go through like four training, months only, yeah. right? Like, yeah. what, what, what was the training phase like? Oh, like you had to have chemistry with the character, right? Like, no, every no, no, day is different. Every like, day, so every day is a different person, but they have a same like, different character. Different, diff- character. Oh, different character, yes. like Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. How, how, how did they even train you for that? Like, um, so uh, we'll have like a two week training process. So okay. what the first week is like a general thing, like don't do this, don't do that, uh, safety stuff, uh. um, a lot of basic, like, and then like please keep all the secrets of Disney safe, you know, oh, okay, stuff okay. like that. So like that's the first the first week of training, and then subsequently you will have specific training for your role. Uh. So if let's say you're a ride attendant, so you are releasing like the roller coaster that kind of thing, oh. you have specialized training for your department. So uh. I can't speak for everyone's training; it's all uh. going to be different. Uh. But specifically for entertainment, we were trained alongside the performers uh. so I'm an attendant and then there's also performers but I, I just didn't want to be a performer because it's a bit claustrophobic to, uh. to do that but 
anyway um they would have uh like one one or two days where they where they will do will they'll get you to test it out in the park oh. yeah, yeah so that's when they will let you go in and then you have the oh. performer just trying out that's so cool yeah so like in a small environment small control environment just to test out first oh. and like try to also because the characters there's an interesting thing that they must sign stuff right and every time a character signs up it must always be the same right yeah, you cannot one day have Mickey Mouse sign Mickey Mouse in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. So Oh that, my gosh, they must train how yeah, to, they, oh. they would like sign like hundreds of it. Yeah. Just to make sure that it's the same it's across the different same, people. yeah. Oh my God, but that's for the performers, I'm not attendant, so I didn't have to do that. But oh mine my. was like really like multitasking on a whole different level. It's like making sure like security is one thing, making sure your character is safe and people don't go and attack. Oh my goodness, there are people that attack the characters. Please don't. <laughs> so, like have you, you personally seen it before? Like how so like yeah. people want to just hug it or yeah, aggressively, yeah, yeah. is it? I'll go into craziness later. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> so um, security is one thing and then it's to manage the crowds, you know, like make sure you communicate with them, tell them when the line is going to be cut mm. or whether you're moving to a different location, mm. all that. So, and then also managing like the different where to put your bag stuff like that everything mm. is must be very seamless and must flow very well yeah. so in every space the mm. the space is different mm. yeah so they basically trained us in, the, in this different aspect so they brought us around like the park to, to observe oh. what the uh, attendants and the performers are doing mm. and how you like can emulate that so mm. like that that was the the second week of training mm. yeah before they, we were allowed to go to the park and actually do what we're supposed oh. to be doing yeah, yeah what are some crazy stories Oh yeah! Disney. Oh my! It's it's like really crazy because some people, uh, when they are like celebrities, you know, like the characters when they come out, they are like people will scream. Mickey Mouse. Yeah, no, oh. Mickey Mouse actually. <laughs> we need a Pooh and Tigger. Oh, that's those are the two yeah. crazy ones. Yeah. So when then let's say they're coming out, you know, walking to their meet and greet location, right? Then people will literally just like go to them and then like pull them back, you know, like they arm lock Tigger, right? And then oh pull my him gosh. back. So I was just like, this is absolute madness, you know. And then they'll throw their children at them. You know? Oh, it's they crazy. Were like, oh. I'm just, okay. they're like take my baby, you know. I'm just like, oh my goodness, please, please go away. Okay, okay. Then you must like okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm oh. Not yeah. So we are like that security, you know. I I felt like a bum in a way like please don't go and attack my characters oh, so like, like so many kids coming over is it actually not the kids it's the adults oh it's adults it's not things. the kids uh. yeah yeah they, the kids would just be like ooh you know but the, but, her, but the parents are just like I'm gonna throw my child at you oh okay, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and another thing is that uh, 4th of July is their oh, yes, independence, yes, independence day, day and I was working on that day it was like a madhouse like uh. it was so crazy the queue like, could get up to like 100 people like just like that in like uh. a few minutes like uh. 2 minutes of the character coming out like uh. there's already 100 people there and the line has to be close and I need to turn away another hundred more. Is so there like a policy where but you can't have the same character within like one KM of each other? You can't see the same character in the same place. Right? I mean of course not. I don't, I don't there's know, only like, one character I, that exists. I, I don't know, know what I'm you're sure saying. There's a policy behind that, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Just a random thought. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if you see two Mickey Mouse fucking each other, that'll be awkward. Cannot, okay, cannot. Okay, that, that that never happens. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're very strict on character integrity in that oh, sense. Yeah. Like you can't I think is it why you can't take off the I mean of course not. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot the, the guidelines for characters are a lot stricter. Ah. Yeah, they have a lot of things to, to take note of when mm. they are performing. What are the kind of macro lessons that you have learned working in Disney? Oh yeah, about that. I think a lot of operational stuff I learned. I learned mm. how to communicate effectively, mm. which seems like a very like, like vague, vague soft skill to have. Mm. But it's really true because you need to be very, very cool under an immense amount of pressure. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of people. Yeah, right? like 4th of July, you have 100 people in front, you have 100 people like uh, behind like trying to like argue with you, trying to talk to you, say oh. that, uh, why are you not letting me into this queue? I demand to talk to this person, I demand oh. that. So it's like, how do you... um cool down the situation it's like I felt like I was like a, you know those police people that try to like you know uh, like massage less, the situation yeah, yeah, just, make it less tense yeah make it less tense uh. always like try to uh, de-escalate the situation uh. because uh, when people approach you like they're always escalating the situation because yeah. they want uh, they want to be heard they want to be understood they want mm. their way mm. especially so definitely in this day it teaches you about how to manage people like that and, mm. and that will definitely translate to next time when you're going to talk to your colleagues how do you make sure that you don't escalate a situation if mm. people are really unhappy mm. yeah so it's just don't take things personally because when I was in Disney right getting like a hundred people like, like let's say cursing me or saying that I'm stupid or whatever uh. it is right it can be very draining yeah. definitely but you must always like be the most professional you can be so mm. I already so through that process I just learned right, to not think things personally when mm. people try to say things about you or your work yeah. you just know that you're doing your best uh. and, and just don't take it personally if not you will just act out mm. yeah from your experience you have interacted with I would assume a lot of Americans in uh, Disney mm. and 
comparing your experiences with working with Americans in a macro sense and working with Singaporeans, is there any general big differences that you see? I think. Well, that, that kind of goes into political, social things. Ah, political? Still, I, don't, I don't get political. Okay, no. <laughs> if you want, I don't mind. No, no, no. no. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, but it varies also because you can't exactly say that about like an entire group of people. Yes, that's right? why I, I don't like But Yeah, just... just yeah. I would... Is there even any or you... you I, there I, is, there yeah. is. Like the, the general consensus I have with the kind of people that I was around was mainly that they didn't really know much about what was happening in the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that that was a bit uh, challenging when it comes to like talking about let's say just cultural sharing, right? Like, oh, I want to talk to you about Singapore. You know, where is Singapore located? Blah blah blah. Mm. And they're like, oh, which part of China is that? Oh, uh, it is it's true. 20, is it? It's That's literally true. twenty like twenty eighteen, and like you like when I was there, and you still don't know that it's not part of China. It's just very difficult. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's a significant portion of uh, Americans uh, that are closed. Yeah. In their own social. Well, I I would say it's also a, a class thing because like if for like my boyfriend for mm. the when he went to America to work everybody mm. was in a in a different social class also because they're all like Harvard and etc oh. etc so those people would obviously know what uh. like geogra- basic world geography and stuff mm. like that right but I would say for like the people that that did let's say work or did come to Disney right they weren't uh. really they didn't really have that very global mindset. They wanted to go there to experience that. Mm. So to explain about what is Epcot, right? Epcot is is a theme park that has 12 countries. So every country, there will be representatives. Oh, okay. Yeah. And for a lot of people, that would be their first time ever having that kind of cultural experience. Oh. And that would be their only time too because they, don't, they travel. wouldn't travel. Yeah, yeah, which is quite a surprise. Like, I talked to many people and they said that, number one, they don't travel uh, out of America. And number two, they don't have any intentions to do so. Mm. So, or at most, the furthest they would go is like Europe and stuff. Mm. Yeah, so many have not ventured to Asia. So I would say Singaporeans are extremely well-traveled mm. uh, versus like the, the Americans. Mm. Yeah, because... A lot of things are we are we are like wealthier and mm. and many men and we are also more connected to the rest of Asia. Mm. So it's very easy for us, let's say, to just drive to Malaysia right mm. now. Yeah. So I would say that that is the primary difference is that 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 macro in terms of like the understanding the world and their different social, political, or cultural differences. Right. Mm. Many Americans don't really have that. At least they have a very surface kind of understanding of that. In mm. for the if if you are if you are not well traveled in that mm. sense. And most people are, are not like in America unless unless you have the wealth to do so, yeah. Did you ever consider of like extending a stay or or working in America? Oh no, I was like oh, done. No. I was oh like, it was like done. Is it? <laughs> yeah, I was like quite done already. Mm. Because um I did that as quite a YOLO thing because uh. I had already graduated. So uh. I had many people saying, What are you doing with your life? Oh wait, oh you graduated already, then you went for this. Oh, okay, yeah. that's cool. No, because I so I had like some kind of like mid like quarter life crisis, right? Wow. I was doing all Everyone these. Of us has <laughs> I was doing all these internships with yeah. all these media companies. I did yeah. another one of a theater company also, mm. and like I was just work 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 work, and then I was like, and then I just suddenly snapped, and I was thinking, why am I doing this? I don't want to mm. do this. Mm. I want to just have fun. Uh. So in the very last possible time I can ever do this in my life, right? I was like, you know what? Just do it. You just know? do it. Yeah, because in since year one. Very cool, uh, like, yes. Yeah. Since year one, people have been telling me, Renee, you know, you should go and try for this program, blah, uh. blah, blah. Then I say, no, but I need to take my career very seriously, you know, oh, okay, messing okay. around. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, but when I hit year four and I finish that. It's you, right? Yeah, I was just like. All your friends are all there oh, working in big companies all in that. Really. Exactly, exactly. So, I'm, I'm just there like, I'm in Disney World and like being a character attendant as operational role. I'm like, what am I doing? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but I don't regret doing it uh, because you won't I won't have this chance to do it again definitely yeah so so yeah so next chapter you come into Singapore what's next so when I came into Singapore I was like looking for a job mm. and um, I I just like revamped my LinkedIn woo LinkedIn okay, okay. yeah and I'm then, sure you have stories to share yeah. on LinkedIn right yeah okay so uh, I, I put my stuff on LinkedIn and just applied to jobs like normal mm. and then uh, my my ex boss uh, the iFast co-founder he like messaged me on LinkedIn he was like hey you know want to have a chat so another show, yeah, cool. Yeah, so I was like, you know, why not? Sure, yeah. you know. Yeah. So so I, I sat down with him and our interview was like three hours long. Three, what what do you guys talk about? I don't know, you know. I just What do you talk, mean you don't know, you know? Like, I, I talk like, a lot. Okay, okay, I, I know but like 
Yeah, was he like? Was he very explicit from the start that he he's looking for someone, or he just wanted to just chat to you in general? He was. He was like oh. they, they. He did explain that they were looking for someone to create video content for them, mm. because they they weren't really happy with like the kind of content they were currently making, so they wanted it to be better. Mm. Yeah. So that's that was the intention. Like so, obviously, I knew that going in, mm. and I was, and so in the first hour, it was all the generic stuff, lah. You know, lah. Where do you see yourself in five years? Oh, you know okay. what. What? How do you think you'll contribute to the company? Those kind of basic stuff. Then I'm after sure that, lasted only like thirty minutes. Thirty minutes at most, like no, it was around forty minutes. Forty minutes, okay. Yeah, and then when we were done, then then we were just talking about other random things like, oh, what camera do you use? Oh, what are your yeah, lenses? Oh, yeah, geeky, geeky stuff, is it? Yeah, like super geeky stuff, and then it's like, like it's, it's, that's the founder. He's a technical guy himself. Like he shoots videos. Ah, uh, no, also. he's actually from marketing also. He's oh. a very he worked in PNG before oh, okay, as a marketer. Okay. Yeah, so. He has a lot of experience in that sense, ah, uh, like twenty oh. over years of experience doing mm. marketing in big, big companies. Mm. Yeah. So, but anyway, so we were talking about it for like three hours, and then immediately at the end of the day, cause I I went to see him at like twelve. I came out at like three. Okay. And then by like six o'clock, right, he already sent me like an offer. Oh, that, that was very fast. Day, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my goodness, I still have interviews to go for. Then he was like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, go go finish your interviews and oh. let us know by the end of the week. Oh. So how fast was this process? Like, how long were you using LinkedIn for before you like got, you were actively building a LinkedIn profile? Um. Yeah. 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 I was. Uh. When I came back, so wait. So it's like within three July. weeks, a month. Um. I came back in to Singapore on September. Okay. And then by October, I had a job. Oh, that's fast. Yeah, I know, and and I I feel like I'm very very lucky in that yeah. sense because. People were always saying, and I was doing all sorts of dramatic. Like I'm never gonna get a job. My my resume is so strange. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and then um and then yeah and then that happened and and he offered me and I did go to the other interviews but I was always hitting a wall because mm. when I said that I wanted like a base of at least three, mm. many people just laughed like they oh, literally okay. laughed at me uh. because they said you can't get this with your kind of background. Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. In in many yeah. video production companies, like I won't I won't say where, but oh. like they they just didn't value um and they didn't want to pay that amount because yeah. it was a very like technical skills job. They wanted yeah. to see your experience in a very literal way. Mm. Yeah, but mine was like I did short films. Mm. I worked in CNA. It still wasn't enough to them. That mm. wasn't considered good experience. Mm. They wanted like two three years of experience. Oh, okay, so it was that like base salary that yeah. they didn't meet. Then you didn't correct. You needed to start at the bottom to mm. move up. Oh, they okay. wouldn't put you. I think there. that's how it. Is like most media agencies, right? Or at least creative agencies. Yeah, but I think it's just very, very challenging because if you're starting, I think that if you want to go into video production, uh, in the video production in general, right? Having a a uh, degree is kind of useless. Yes, it's really useless. Yeah, it's your portfolio that matters. Yeah, yeah, it's really yeah. useless. Even if let's say design or whatever, those those things that require portfolio, right? It's yeah. very useless. You have a degree, it doesn't prove anything. Yeah, it doesn't prove you'll be a good video editor. You're mm. a good video producer, stuff mm. like that. So, I was always hitting a wall. And when he offered me to work in his in the company mm. in IFAS, right? I was like, you know, why not just give it a shot. Mm. And and so after I went finished my interviews and I and they were all turning me down as in I was actually turning them down like the last one I was like you know what you laughed at me I'm done you know bye oh, okay <laughs> yeah but at least you know what you want that's very good la. yeah 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 like and and I was very firm about it yeah. I wasn't willing to like 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 sway from what I wanted mm, yes. and and m- many people would and I don't blame them because they just want a foot in the door like, yes to yes enter yes. first you know at least at least have that's a shot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah at least have a shot at least start somewhere right mm. but. I I just said that you know no I I want this this paid start so I was very firm and mm. eventually when he offered me I was like okay I'm just gonna start I'm gonna mm. do this mm. yeah are there any other stories on LinkedIn that, or at least what are the general tips that you, because sometimes I feel that applying for jobs at least nowadays mm. like uh, do you use a resume like in, in your for me at least how a resume played a part in how I got my jobs or at least with my previous jobs right it was like very little that's what I feel. Like how do you feel about LinkedIn in general? How how do you use it as a platform? Yeah, because I mean, because of the nature of what we do, right? Uh. Like, uh, we are like video and we're content creators. So uh. looking at a piece of paper doesn't really prove whether you are very very good at doing that or mm. not. Yeah. So, um, I would say my experience in LinkedIn has been very very positive because I would always have like again I was very lucky when I was in one year in IFAS, right? Along the way, also near nearing the the end of that one year, I had a lot of people starting to message me on LinkedIn like mm. saying that they want to have a chat and stuff like that so I was always open to talking to people but sometimes they will offer or they won't offer I'll just be okay because mm. it's actually just have a chat with them you know yeah. and then you just know like even what your competitors are doing mm. and you're like are we on the right track like is that what 
uh, or even my career is this where I'm going etc so I would just always have a chat with them try to figure out what it is they want to do what they're currently doing mm. so that's my experience with LinkedIn is that oh. it's like a social media platform for careers like people that want to grow their career mm. be it literally training a job or be it just like knowing what other people are doing in the industry mm. it's really important to keep you updated because like even if you're sending a piece of paper it's, it's just you don't really get to talk to people like on the yeah. phone you know yeah, yeah. Then how was your experience at iFast? oh it was very very challenging mm. because I was the only video producer in the whole company so I was really tasked to do like quite a lot of things e- every, everything basically yeah when it comes basically to content, yeah yeah oh. lang, like everything what was the top I mean how did you okay at least a challenge my, a challenge that I face right when it comes to content production right mm. like how do you give yourself a structure that you adhere to that uh, which is a since which is a system that uh, is optimized that makes things easy for you do, do you have a system in place in terms of let's say content strategy how oh. do you go go around doing it? So back, so the, the thing about it was that my previous role wasn't very optimized because I wasn't with marketing. Oh, so I was running. You aren't with marketing. Yeah. Also, you're you're producing videos that you're taking orders essentially, or how is it? Uh, how is the working relationship like? So, so I wasn't with marketing, and my my founder did not want to put me in marketing because he wanted me to be independent. He didn't want me to be swayed by what marketing wanted me to do. Oh, okay. But that didn't really work out exactly as planned because mm. I ended up doing a lot of marketing related stuff oh. as well. But uh, in terms of scheduling, right? So since I can't plan strategy in that sense, I can only schedule. So I would schedule every month because my KPI was one video a week. Oh. So I would schedule to do like one video every week. And then okay. sometimes if there are demands or what or like requests, I would shift things around, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So mm. yeah, so can that's you how break things down in a very layman way? Like okay, how you you need to produce a video in one week? Like mm. where do you start? I, I like, where do you start? Like do you bring like? look at social media trends or the big topics around because IFAS uh, produces videos more towards the finance industry is it? Yeah 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 like what's, your, what's your structure in terms of finding content oh, that is worth producing and making a video for? Um, it's, it's all internal driven so that's why when what I do is that okay let's say now we want to shoot a video about Okay, no, if I say unit trust, people might not know. Okay, let's say let's say bonds, okay? okay. Let's say there's this really interesting bond called the Singapore Singapore Airlines bond. Okay. okay? So that's a retail bond and people can buy the bond. Okay. Oh. So now I'm thinking, okay, a lot of our consumers or a lot of our investors want to see that kind of content. Mm. So uh, first I will go and look at our site and see what articles we've written. Okay, so okay, this is just really Singapore Airlines bonds and they go into really, really technical details. Mm. So now I have the article, I'll have a look at the article mm. and then I will go to the writer which is in, in the office right oh. now and I'll ask, okay, uh, then before I go to the writer, I would start to, to like highlight some of the key points that I want inside mm. and then cancel out all the things that I don't want. Mm. So basically just condense it to like a very a simple, yeah, like a one content. page kind of thing. Then I'll go to the writer and say, hey, you know, this is the this is what I want to do for like the video. Mm. Yeah, so that's, it either works where I go to the researchers or the researchers come to me and say that this is a good idea. Mm. So then we will have like a bit of a discussion and say, okay, let's let's do this and the, the content mm. is fixed. So the supervisor will sign, like will say, okay, it's fine. Mm. And then I'll shoot the video edit the video and so the writer else. will produce a what, what a script or yeah so they would uh, sometimes they would condense like their really really long research articles mm. into like a one page thing oh, okay. and I'm always make sure I'm very strict on them because if I'm not strict on them they will go rambling on yeah rambling on maybe too much technical details and yeah, it, which yeah, may yeah. lose the interest of people watching it correct, or correct. Content. Yeah, yeah. Oh. what are difficulties when it comes to producing content like this did you have a lot of like red tape or like things you could or could not talk about did you have a lot of freedom in the kind of content that you produced mm, i had a lot of freedom to do a lot of things mm. but i think the difficulty is not that there was a lot of red tape the difficulty was really in communication because i think fundamentally that's what um like that's what breaks down not breaks down that that is what is the main issue within why you would stay somewhere or you wouldn't stay somewhere at least for me mm. like because like the, the communication wasn't exactly very very good either because my my big boss wanted me to do something mm. and then my small boss I had two bosses by the oh, way that, that wanted me to do something completely different that's, dif- that's difficult to manage right yeah and that was like a year like that was okay. very 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 challenging like oh. when you when you made made content good for one you did not please the other you can't please everyone right but yeah, when it's, it's specifically two people and it's polar opposite oh, let polar me just opposite, tell you that right? it's not okay. even on like the same page it's a completely different book you know oh, okay. <laughs> so you win one either or one, one of the other yeah so that was like the difficulty mainly it's just like 
like one person will say, oh, you're doing great. And the other one, like, not so great. Oh, <laughs> it's just oh. like, huh, then I, what am I doing? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, but in terms of the content I was making, uh, I, I started to do like other projects, like event related, ads related. So Is I, it like other projects meaning freelance or still within the company? No, no, within the company. Okay, within like the company. I was starting to pitch more rather than... Or than different varieties of content. Correct, right. Uh. So like I wanted to do like event advertisements, mm. product advertisements, uh. all that. So I would go, like they would tell me, hey, you know, there's a new product or there's uh. a new event. Mm. And then I would think about how do I want to like sell this uh, event or sell uh. this this stuff. So I would do like ads for that. Mm. Yeah, but then again, there was that communication breakdown between me and the marketing because I would pitch that it would get approval, I would do the thing, and then it would not run as an ad. Oh so, shit! So that it, is, it, your efforts are wasted. Yeah, right? and that happened three times. Oh. So that's why I felt like like I was constantly hitting a wall mm. because I would go through the entire process, like like it would get approved, and I would do everything, mm. and then I'll just hit a wall. Like, so okay. like the week's worth of effort is just yeah for, for nothing. Yeah, yeah, sometimes more than, than, than just one week, like a few weeks work, worth of work, it oh. will just go to waste because nobody deliberately clicks on the ad, you know. Oh. Just, yeah. And you say ad, Facebook ads, like digital ads or like ads on which platform? Television? A uh, Facebook ads, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, but they were focusing a lot on like traditional media ads. They, they, they would advertise on print, radio, TV, like not TV, yeah, print and radio. Mm. I mean, not. because my perspective comes from running ads. I thought like how when you produce a video for an ad, is there any difference? Like how how would you produce a video for an ad? Um, if it's I guess it, like your like thought process in general, because there's many f- uh, uh opinions about this on how you should mm. create a video. Some people think that it, or at least Facebook thinks that it should be less than fifteen seconds. Some people uh, have a different strategy. They want to run one hour videos on it, and you can retarget people based on their in, uh, how much you watch all the kind of strategy but how, yeah. how was your thought process into making videos for as ads yeah like I think personally I'm not for the long form kind of ads mm. I'm really for the short form ads oh. and, and it has to have a hook mm. so like for the like I, I will look at the analytics also I will see like where is the drop off point you know mm. like what how many seconds do people watch of this and then mm. they just give up mm. and it's just like a ding bong you know oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so so between videos you can see the difference like. yeah I can see that any but general tips in terms of producing videos as ads oh, I I'm, don't I'm know. sure you have seen so many you have produced so many videos yeah. as ads like, what a, but only of, one of them got run as an ad <laughs> only one of them but that was very successful oh okay. Like, okay. what do you define as a successful ad uh, because like in terms of numbers like they weren't hitting the, the amount of um, people to attend the event oh, after, okay. after I ran after we ran my ad then the numbers uh, got bumped up by like nearly like I think 50-60% so it's a lead generation to a particular workshop that your company yeah, was yeah, organizing yeah a particular event and something oh. like that so so like when I when we when we sat down again after the thing and they said that the ad was successful it was in that sense like I'm helping to promote that event Oh yeah. Yeah. So for me, what I did was that okay. So my ad was like thirty seconds, mm. and then um I had like a five seconds. Like in the first five seconds, I was thinking, what do I want to put that will hook people? So for me, that ad, uh, what I did was that I put like some of the biggest names. So like I put like Facebook, Xiaomi, blah blah, right in the first few seconds. So people mm. are just like, oh, what is it about these companies? Then I say, oh, do you want do you want a, a piece of like all these companies? Mm. So that was like my hook la. That was how my thought process went. So you always come out with like ten hooks, then you just edit them accordingly. Yeah. So no, I I would plan it in a sense that okay, this this is the hook, and then I'll just um like do do like simple very simple like uh graphics and animation mm. stuff like this thing here and there mm. yeah yeah so that was what i did uh, for the only ad that i managed to run oh, so yeah, only yeah. One, only one yeah ad. but the other ads just didn't run yeah mm. so is, i can't is this say ad, uh available available publicly uh or i don't know where to find it know. now is yeah, it on yeah. the company's youtube channel mm, it, no it, it, i, I love seeing ads oh no it's not, not okay, it's okay. not yeah yeah yeah. Okay. yeah yeah it's not because it was only run for a very short period of time like the mm. facebook ads one week kind of so your video drives people to a particular workshop event yeah. event then what is there an upsell product you were saying that your company would upsell them financial products okay no so the events is just to introduce them to certain like like to certain financial products but at the end of the day that isn't really um we have a lot of traffic already as it is because the oh. company is, is very very big so they sell all the financial products be it unit trust stocks reits bonds um, all of it okay. so people would like transact themselves mm. it's, it's essentially a financial broker so oh. instead of you going to a bank you go to like my like the FSM one which is uh, which is our platform where you can buy directly oh. so right now you can set up an account put $100 this every month this platform is called FSM one yeah FSM one 
Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So and it's DIY, and and it and the agent fees are like the lowest in the entire financial industry. Oh, yeah. for myself, I use DBS because I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 But 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 those are it's, it's a similar platform, just different. Correct, correct. And and the the main like USP unique selling point <laughs> is that is that ours is like the cheapest. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. In terms of fees, is it? Yeah, in terms of the like agency fees. So changing gears, right? Uh, you were talking about the importance of financial planning, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, b- before I go into what you're doing right now, yeah, like. What do you think of financial planning in general? Um, I think I think people just need to really start young, and mm. they need to first. It's very intimidating, I would say that because initially when I'm going in, right, I'm just like bombarded with a bunch of jargon, you know. Yes. Like, yeah, and and when you're trying to look for information, you are always seeing people saying about how something is good or something is bad and blah blah, and you are constantly sometimes having too much information is a bad thing, you know, like the theory of, uh, what <laughs> the agree. conflict of a uh, conflict of choice or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, the thing about financial, like financial planning, is that first you need to start young and start learning about these things. You know, mm. you cannot wait until you are like thirty five years old before you start investing into your future. Mm. So, I was really never like that. I didn't really think that far, honestly. I was just thinking, I want to do whatever I want to do right now. Mm. I don't care whether I make money or don't make money. I'm oh. just gonna have fun. Mm. Yeah. So, um, but for me, when I was entering my company, I learned a lot of things. That's the thing. I learned a lot about like the financial products. How do they work? Um, what is risk profiles and different investment styles? Mm. A lot of things. And and one thing that I got out of it in terms of uh, learning about myself was that what kind of investor am I? Mm. So if you think. So everybody can like take a quiz about what kind of investor they are. There are people that are low risk and then there are people that are high risk. Mm. So sometimes, um, so for me personally, I'm very high risk. Mm. But <laughs> that sounds crazy. Yeah, yeah. But I, like I'm a high risk person. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, in terms of investment, yes, and then yes. there are people that are low risk. So yes. to give examples, like, um, if you are low risk, you would invest in things like bonds. You know, that have very stable income. After the maturity date, you get the money. Mm. Yeah, so it's like let's say the bonds give you uh three percent or something. You're mm. like, oh, okay, I'm more than happy with three percent. I'm mm. I don't need the liquidity, so I don't need my money immediately. Mm. I can just give five thousand. Okay, I'm fine with the three percent, mm. right? So that's like a, a low risk mm. kind of thing. But if you're a high risk kind of person like me, right, then you will start looking into stocks, unit trusts, all this kind of stuff, mm. where there is specific that where the returns are a lot higher. So mm. it can be as high as like seven to like ten percent mm. over a long period of time, like, you know, mm. like compound interest or that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I wasn't in finance, so I didn't learn all these things, I learned it by myself. <laughs> can I ask what is your I actually because I, I had a guest last week who is uh who's uh, in a cryptocurrency space. Oh okay. So what he does is that he manages uh people's money into uh, putting their money to expose it to the asset class of uh, crypto. Okay, okay uh, uh, sorry, just to check. <laughs> What's your opinion? On, okay, this question is the question I asked him. What's your opinion on financial advisors? Oh, okay. So I cannot be very critical on that because half <laughs> my family are insurance oh, agents. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. So I have a very interesting take on it. Yes, um, yes. I I personally don't actually listen to a lot of what they say, like because half my family insurance agents, and a lot of times they will always sell me like insurance products, and I think that's that's the misconception of FAs and what they're supposed to be doing, because for financial advisors, fundamentally they're supposed to be helping you manage your finances, and that doesn't include only insurance, right? Yeah, so so especially for uh, let's say my brother, he's trying to learn more, so he's trying to like help uh, people more with like planning their finances in terms of other financial products. He's a FA? Yeah, he's a FA. Okay. Aside, from, uh, aside from only insurance, right, start to build their portfolio in different ways. Mm. Yeah, so I think FAs in general have a really, really bad name for themselves because of their approach, right? Because they're approaching because people. Because they're very commission-based, is it? Yeah, they're commission-based and they and how much you buy from them is how much they make. Yeah. So therefore, obviously, at the, like there are a lot of re- regulations are supposed to help the person. You're not supposed to sell them products that are not good for them. Blah blah blah. Like the but basic legislation of it is not supposed to lah. Yeah. But so that's why they've been given a very bad name because it's always like, hey, you need to buy this, you need to buy that, you need to buy this, buy that. Mm. And and the insurance sector, right? We can talk about what what I've been right now. But the insurance sector has been so saturated with people that are constantly trying to sell you a product and and not really explain other things about your financial planning you know mm. they're always telling you okay so the thing i i i that's this is how i'm gonna frame it okay insurance sells you fear and other financial products sells you hope okay, okay? so let me explain uh. 
So insurance sells you fear because if let's say you are now a, a young father and you have a child, you are very worried if the if you pass away, your child cannot afford education. Yeah. So you are fearful of that. Yeah. So they are selling you. So if they sell you a policy, right, whatever it may be, like term or life, right, it's to protect your child, yeah. right? It's protection and mm. and so they are basically selling you fear. And if if on the other hand, right, you are in, you are someone that looks at other financial products like unit trust or stocks, right? You're you're selling hope mm. because you want your money to be able to grow that way. You want mm. that after like ten years, right? Your one thousand is now like a thousand five hundred or something like that because mm. you're not hoping. Mm. So that's how I view like financial products in that sense. Mm. Because when now like financial advisors or like my brother or whoever is trying to approach me to buy their product, right? Then I ask them. Like I'll throw the question back at them. It's like, who are my dependents? I don't have dependents. So right now, I'm I'm growing my wealth. I don't need to protect anything right now. Of course, health like go and get your health insurance and stuff like that. Mm. But also go and look at your company's policies on health insurance. Yeah. So I think just you need people just need to learn more about mm. these things. You know, keep asking questions. If your FA sells you these policies, like constantly ask like what and constantly go and like compare with other people and say like, oh, you know what. What, what are you covered for? Like, why are you being covered? Mm. All that kind of things. And mm. and mainly, right, don't buy it just because someone tell, tra- tells you you should buy it. Mm. You know, really think about what is your financial situation now? Mm. What are you protecting? What are you hoping for? Mm. Yeah, so that is what... Okay, that's just my view in general. Not not really just FAs specifically, okay. but yeah. Because at least uh, the, the, the uh, Royal, the, the guest I had last week, he, mm. it was in his general opinion yeah. that he feels that people should just get this basic knowledge of investing by themselves instead of going through a financial advisor. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to compounding over 30, 40 years, right, he feels that he most he mostly thinks that um, it's better off that you can invest by yourself, whereby they go to platforms directly like your company, mm. the broker broker platform directly to yeah. buy and make their own investment decisions. Correct. Compared correct. to going through a financial advisor because the difference within a 30 year period, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars of yeah. compounding. So, What's your thoughts on that? I uh, okay. I'll just mm. say that I've been uh, once bitten twice shy because for me, um, I bought into let's say an investment endowment plan uh, oh, okay. before I knew a lot about investments, uh, investments in, general, in yeah. general. So after a period of time where I started to pick more books and mm. like reading up about investing, yeah, I felt yeah. that putting my money in the endowment investment wasn't the best thing I could do. Yeah, because that means that you're not a low risk investor. Yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, not, yeah. I'm not a low risk <laughs> investor. So so um. Upon finding that out, then I, I went through all this uh, tussle with my financial advisor and she didn't tell me certain things which I felt that she should have told me that in the end, I lost my capital on that. Oh, okay. When I, when, in, okay in short, I terminated my, I terminated my policy. Yeah. Given, uh, because I had the assumption that I would get my principal back. But okay, that's another issue. I should okay. make a video about it. <laughs> okay, but, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, what, what are your basic uh, top line information about that? In my opinion, I think it's better to have a financial advisor if you are, I would say in a very harsh way because I'm biased in a sense mm-hmm. because um, I'm ignorant. Oh, wait, what am I talking about? <laughs> I would say for people that don't bother to equip themselves with any financial knowledge, it's better to go through an FA rather okay. than not do anything at all. Mm. Um, any top line opinions on that? Uh, my opinion is very you should equip yourself with the knowledge instead yeah, of going to an Yeah, because FA. knowledge is power, right? Mm. And and it's because now you have that information on hand, you feel like you got betrayed in a sense that like you got you got sold this product that's actually not right for you mm. because you mm. you were it actually the thing about endowment is that now that I'm learning about it, it's actually nothing really wrong because mm. there are people that really want that kind of security. Yeah. And there are, yeah, so I always look, initially I looked at it in a negative light. Like, what kind of lousy returns is 2%? Or what on earth? You know, like to me personally as an investor, that uh. doesn't appeal to me at all. Mm. But that does not mean that it doesn't appeal to other people. Yes. So that's my perspective on it. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, that's why first and foremost, before even you approach an FA, right? Find out what it is you want to like. Find out more about not just okay. Before you go and approach the whole investment landscape, because it's so big, there's so many things going on. It mm. can be quite overwhelming. Mm. Just try to figure out what what are your what are your goals. Mm. You start there first, okay? You mm. know, just don't go into all the unit trust stocks, cryptocurrency, woo woo. Oh. You know, like all very hot topics, right? Oh. I would just say, 
what are your goals mm. you know how are you going to achieve those goals and like just think about your financial goals so for example let's say my this year's goal was to like save up 10,000 right mm. so that's just a simple financial goal mm. and how you do it along the way you start to reorganize your spending habits you know mm. spend less on let's say buying my makeup or buying oh. clothes mm. stuff like that people just people are so excited to jump into all these exciting investment products yeah. but they don't even look at their daily kind of spending you know yeah. if you don't look at that right then you're already not doing yourself any justice or so mm. right so you first take control of your own finances mm. yeah day to day try to figure mm. out what you spend on what are your goals uh. what what are your bigger goals let's say you want to travel so mm. you need to have those goals in mind mm. when you have those goals in mind then you you like you lock it down okay i know what do i want to do with mm. my money mm. rather than frivolously spend everything so that is the step one uh. okay i think everyone should just need to know that mm. yeah clear goals for yourself on yeah. what you want to spend money on yeah clear goals of what what is prior what is a priority to you mm. yeah and if and the next step right is then to to so financial goals align you you need to have your own and then like, let's say align it with your partner whatsoever yeah. like talk about money i think people mm. don't talk about money enough mm. and they should whether you earn how, more earn less how do you talk about money i just i just talk about you money, money okay. yeah <laughs> just, i was talking about it's like a very like, sensitive yeah sensitive thing la. yeah and especially for like for women also because uh. like they always are told that i don't know like you like we, we we don't have like much control over our spending we're always spending on like a lot of beauty stuff like the oh. more i look into like the beauty industry and how much actually women spend to try to look good right oh. it's it's ridiculous versus guys right you just roll out of bed <laughs> wear your glasses throw on some clothes and then go out yeah right yeah. then here i am like putting on my makeup all okay. that like as in i like doing this but the more i look at like if I break down my expenses and how much money I spend, right? Mm. And uh, like what the lashes are, the hair dyes, mm. the everything, right? Mm. People can spend hundreds of dollars. I mean, it's, it depends on your goals like, at the end of the day. Correct, correct. Uh. But like for, for women, you can spend like, like for just women in general, you can spend hundreds of dollars a month just going to these things that only last so short. Uh. Yeah, so like for me, I used to really do all these things and mm. I don't feel like there's anything wrong. But mm. but when I sat down and I asked myself what are my priorities, I realized I mm. don't actually want a lot of these things mm. i just needed to slowly tone it down mm. so that's what i did so like for me before i even started all the investments or that right uh. i was like i need to know where my money is going to like yeah. there's this thing known as phantom spend where you yeah. look at your credit card like what on earth seven <laughs> like seven hundred dollars what is this like 72 dollar thing yeah. you no idea you know like you mm. look at it and it's like abc company you're just like huh what, what? yeah mm. so i I took control of that and I think taking control of your finances is like power also because yes. now you know every dollar where it goes. Mm. So that's what I, I did. I was very, very strict on myself. Like mm. I'm not going to spend like ridiculous amounts of money on this and that mm. and I'm going to treat myself and it must be a treat oh. because when you always have the excuse like I'm going to treat myself the nails and uh. then that is like an every week thing. Oh, okay, okay. Is it a monthly budget? Like, like okay, I'm going to spend not more than $300 on treating myself or is it a very like black and white harsh thing like okay you don't give yourself any allowance to exceed that mm, no 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 like I, I i went through two extremes i went through extreme spending then i went through extreme saving so oh, now okay, i'm trying okay. to find like this balance right? so you're in the balance right now yeah yeah, yeah. Okay, i'm okay. in a balance right now because oh. now uh, i've bought like 100 over dollars of stuff for myself uh, because mm. it's like a treat yeah yeah because like when i go and look back at my financial statements like i mean my credit card statements mm. right i would see uh, how much money i'm spending on a day to day so mm. I would say that like, let's say in the like to be transparent let's say like in february or march my bill was like what thousand five hundred crazy mm. amount mm. and then last month it was like like 400 mm. oh. so yeah yeah last month 400 only yeah 400. you only spent 400 in one month yeah yeah, yeah. On wow my, on my credit card la, like, oh, okay, okay. yeah yeah but like let's say cash or whatever let's say 500 okay mm. yeah so that's like a a big big jump and then i would see my savings grow like at an exponential rate then you can put that to investments yeah yeah uh. but, but that was that was later on oh, right okay, yeah okay. so it's like start growing your savings first before mm. you put everything because the the one thing people need to know before i start investments is what you need, you need uh. savings right uh. yeah so that's why that's why um regarding like the whole fa or no fa thing mm. i think first just take control of your your savings and spending mm. that's just one thing like Be conscious about it yeah you don't actually need an fa to figure that out because mm. you you should figure it out yourself you know mm. as an adult just think about it sit down think about it mm. look at your finances look at how much goes in oh. how much goes out oh you sound freaking passionate about like money savings yeah eh? i'm like so passionate like, i oh. didn't used to be but now when i see my savings when did grow, this turning point uh, come to you I think I think it was like my boyfriend eh, because he's was so he, was he, prudent. He prudent. Oh, he's prudent. Yeah, it? he's extremely extremely prudent. Then I would like so before meeting before getting together with him, you you were like a crazy spender. Yeah, it? I was a crazy also, spender. Also, that was like one good 
thing that you got from him. Is yeah, it? yeah, but I mean, I've been together with him for four years, so I've four been a crazy years. spending for a very long time. Also, so it's not like an overnight thing, like it's slowly uh, osmosis that <laughs> happens, is it? Osmosis. Yeah, like, osmosis. You realize, hey, why are you not spending so much? Now I'm spending so much. Is it like, how, was, he, was he a kind of partner that, oh, you should spend, you should, don't spend so much? Or he'll like, just let, let it be. Or it was something that you observe, I mean, hey, why are you like not spending so much? How, how was it like? How do you get this? thing from him. How do I snap? Uh, like yeah, because I'm sure, I, I don't know, uh, but yeah, this kind of lessons, sometimes it's overnight for some people, sometimes it takes a long period of time. Yeah. I'm assuming, I, I don't know, but I'm assuming it took very long for you. I mean, I really didn't take it that seriously. I didn't take it all that seriously. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. like when I was in uni and stuff, you know, oh. you're getting a, like your like your parents will give you oh. pocket money. Oh, you're taking, par- uh, your p- taking money from your parents during uni? Yeah, yeah, yeah like oh, let's okay, say $100 yeah. a, a week or something. Oh. I can't remember. Yeah, oh. yeah, but... But then I didn't really have to take it that seriously, mm. and I didn't. I oh. would always go holidays, have, and then this this year I also went on a ton of holidays. I went like five different countries. But you paid for it. Yeah, yeah, I paid oh, for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but when I was looking at things, I was like, I want to travel, but like mm. I want to travel like purposefully. You know, mm. I I don't want to keep spending and spending and spending. Like I feel mm. very like empty in a sense mm. with how much money was going away, mm. and also I would buy like branded bags. Oh. So again, like money is just disappearing for no reason, and oh. and when and then. I was like thinking how I started to view money very differently. Like I started to value money differently. I when I, you were with your boyfriend or like this happened internally within yourself. This happened this year. Like, oh, this year only. Yeah, like the beginning of okay. this year. Yeah, and everything, everything just and so it went from like extreme spending, like I said, right. Then slowly started to the like savings one. My boyfriend didn't really say much of anything. It was more of like him. Um, he's constantly like the same kind of person like he'll always try to spend not so much money mm. but I'm trying to encourage him to spend money so that's the <laughs> opposite problem you okay. know it's a big it's, it oh. can be a problem because okay. if you're too prudent right you don't want to do a lot of things you're yes, like yes. this is expensive that is expensive I don't want to do this I have to pay for that huh? mm. so it's like that balance so if extreme spender is me right and mm. my boyfriend is like extreme saver then it's just trying to like like balance. So right now you're, you're, it's more being equal right now? Yeah, yeah it's like balance. Like he's still really extreme saver, but oh. I'm like really going back down really, really low. Really. What are the things worth spending money on for you right now? For me? Yeah, mm-hmm. given that you have a scale down because you're more conscious of what you spend money on. So what are the mm-hmm. things that you feel that it's worth spending? Um. Oh yeah, okay. First I need to like talk a bit about like the value of it. Like, right, right. Okay, so okay. yeah, yeah. So, so what are other things I really like? Very random, but I really like furniture. So I wanted to completely redo my room, okay. which I did it. I did like, I bought like two drawers, one shelf, all this whole bunch of nonsense. And oh. it was all under $700. Uh, where do you, like I- Ikea? Yeah, Easy yeah, buy? Ikea and Ikea, Man- Easy Buy, all oh. that. Yeah, yeah, many, many different places. So it's very, so the thing is how I managed to like have this entire change, right? Was to not stop myself from spending. Was to not, uh, why? Okay, but, with limits. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so What's like you ask, like you ask about the budget thing, yeah. right? For for me, right, is I was I have a big project. So let's say my big project was to do my like furniture for my room. Oh. So that meant that like the hundred dollars that I was spending to uh let's say to have a really good meal, right? Mm. But was actually a hundred dollars I could use to buy like two shelves. Yes. So the moment I frame it that way, okay, I know nobody's excited about shelves as much as I am, but like the moment I framed it in my mind that way, right, this hundred dollars is not going to my two shelves, right? It's going to to like a meal, right? Then I don't want it anymore. You like could spend it on something more that you want. Yeah, yeah. I actually really want ah, that. Yeah. yeah. So and also I gave myself a, a, a budget, like a very hard budget, like of seven hundred and I went six hundred and ninety nine dollars and sixty five cents. Oh, I was so on the spot. I was so okay. strict on myself that oh. I would not exceed that. Oh. And so, and the thing about consumerism, right, is that you always get a pleasure out of the anticipation of buying, not so much the actual <laughs> yeah. item itself. Yes. Because let's say you're like thinking about, oh, you know, I want to get AirPods, you know, like, wow, you know, they are going to be so amazing. Like, I'm going to have this kind of lifestyle. I'm so cool. You yeah. know, I'm so rich. Yeah. yeah so um, the anticipation to getting it, right, is actually more exciting mm. than the actual product yes, itself. Yes, yes, Right. Yeah. And, and so I was, I just like, just elongated the anticipation. Elongated, like, you were constantly buying then waiting for it to come? Like, no, no, no. What, what I mean elongated, elongated meaning like I would plan. Oh, plan. Buy. Okay, okay. Starting from the planning yeah, stage. Yeah, so I would have a oh. really long time before I can actually buy it. Oh, okay, okay. I yeah, see, so I now see. it's like, okay, imagine $700 in uh. one year. That's the budget, right? Mm. Then you think about it. If you really break it down, let's say 
every month you can spend seventy dollars or so. Yeah. But I wouldn't break it down that specific. Uh. I know that if let's say right now I bought uh. a two hundred dollar um cabinet or something, right? Mm. That means that I only have like five hundred dollars left. left. Uh. So I would really really need to be very careful with where that five hundred dollars goes to. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, but I still have the anticipation because I know I'm going to spend five hundred dollars. So you've spent everything this year already, is it? Yeah, yeah, I've hit it already. In November, oh, okay, I hit. Okay. So then next year, is like I can rethink again what's my budget if I do want to to continue mm. doing it. But it's hard, like. Oh. It it's when you put limits on your spending, right? It can be very hard, but it's also incredibly like um. It forces freeing. you to optimize that yeah. hundred dollars. It's incredibly freeing also because I get everything I want under that budget, and it's so rewarding. Like mm. I literally get what I want, and I get it for a a good price. Mm. Yeah, and and it's not there are no more impulse buys. So right now mm. for me, I'm trying to, as much as possible to cut impulse buys. Mm. Always write it out. So it's like let's say I need to buy shampoo or I uh. need to buy. Let's say my foundation is out, but uh. I always use the same foundation. I'll write mm. it down. Okay, I'll mm. write down like your shopping list or that. Mm. I won't immediately go to the shop start picking out random things. Mm. I I stop doing that. Or if let's say I want to get new clothes for work, uh. it's just writing it down and. Is it Excel sheet or is like is it no no journal? just like in my like phone. Oh, I just your write phone. It down. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So. So that's how I don't specifically every single thing need a budget, mm. but for like bigger projects like my room, like mm. redo all that, mm. then it's like a hard limit. Mm. And it was very refreshing to see my room get to exactly what I want it to uh, be with that, that limit. Price. Yeah, with that limit in place. And I still managed to achieve my goals. Mm. So if you can achieve your goals and do it under budget, that's like a win win, you know? Yeah. And I get so much more like it's so it's so much Satisfied. more rewarding. Yeah, it's so much more rewarding that it's like affordable. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So changing gears, right? Okay. What is it that you currently do right now? Which company are you at right now? Uh, Policy Pal. So it's like an insurance tech company. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So what is your exact role? What exactly do you do? Uh, I'm a content strategist. So right now I'm just like planning stuff like in December and mm. all that. What kind of articles are we gonna do? And planning our videos, mm. all that kind of stuff. So are you? Yeah. As on the ground, like do you shoot everything, or you mainly have a team to work with? Is uh, now I have like a team of like other people in like the marketing department, so mm. they will assist me. So it's not just me uh, running everything alone now, mm. but it's a lot more discussion, and mm. and I I'm, I'm enjoying it so far, lah. Cause it's only been one week. It's very hard for me to say. Yeah, you, you got this job through LinkedIn. Yeah, also like, through LinkedIn. How, how so? So Wait, again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the like? again the CEO uh, messaged me online and then mm. after that I was like okay you know I'll have a chat with you I wasn't, re- I wasn't really very very interested in going to insurance but I was like why not just chat with you mm. so after we like had a talk and I was like oh wow well, the money was good oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's yeah. something that's attractive yeah, yeah the okay. money was good and also um, the, the scope of work was a lot more mm. so I just wanted to try like I wanted mm. to learn more because in my previous company I felt like I was the smartest person there oh. I said no 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 that sounds very bad no I was like <laughs> the smartest person doing videos there. Oh, okay, okay. You know what I mean? Like you're the only one of your specialization. Oh, so when you're there, there are more video editors that to bounce off ideas. Or no, 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 there aren't video editors, but there are other marketing people. Oh, so okay. we have to be aligned in order to like do stuff. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wanted to grow that in that direction. I didn't mm. want to grow uh, as much just doing the same thing again and again and again. Mm. I wanted to learn more about how do I like make my videos engaging. Mm. How do I uh, make my content interesting to read? Mm. All that kind of stuff like that. I wasn't really learning before because I was the only one doing videos there. At, at what point? I mean, do you mind if I ask? Like, at yeah. what point in your previous job do you feel that you have stopped learning? At least for me, I I need to learn. I I, I when I go into a job. I need to learn something new every day. I hope oh, at okay. least that's, yeah. At least that's, this whole process lah. But at which point of time was it an immediate thing in your previous company that you feel that felt that you stopped learning? Or uh, I think I was just like I felt a bit stuck. Stuck. Like, huh? Yeah, yeah. In a sense, I was always doing the same kind of thing. It mm. felt like repetitive. And when I was talking to like having chats with other like other companies, right? They were saying about their own projects and what they were running and mm. why they were running it. And I was so inspired. Like the grass is always greener. Is yeah, it? in a way, the grass is greener. But I was like very inspired. I was like, mm. I can do so much more, mm. and I believe I have the potential to do more. Mm. So that's why when I had this offer, I was like, yeah, I want to try. You know, mm. and because if I don't try, I won't fail. Yeah, mm. and I want to. Okay, that sounds weird. Yeah, yeah, okay. but yeah, yeah, yeah. If I constantly am the only one doing like something that is my specialization, then mm. I don't have people telling me it's bad. I don't have mm. I only people telling me it's good because yeah. nobody would know otherwise, right? Yeah. yeah, so so in a way I want to be able to have like the criticisms as well as like the positiveness of mm. of, of working. Uh. Mm. Yeah, and I want to grow so and, and that's why even in my previous company I'm constantly like taking courses, yeah. Mm. I do a lot of Coursera courses. I love oh, Coursera. Oh yeah, yeah. I realize it's something on LinkedIn, right? Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. I just like I also because my boyfriend is in supply chain. I also take mm. supply chain courses. Mm. So random, yeah. Mm. I know, but I don't like 
learning things that I don't want. So nobody will ever force me to do something that I don't want. Yeah. Yeah. Same as like. I mean, my entire education, right? Mm. Like, it's always English lit. Nobody will say, oh, you know, marketing is so much more profitable. You should go to that instead. I'm just like, no, I'll do whatever I want. Mm. Yeah, so, like, even for me, like, when I'm learning, right, I'm I'm very interested to learn about mm. new things, right? Because mm. I don't feel that pressure that somebody is forcing me to do it, you mm. know? Even I'm learning the supply chain thing. I'm learning how to, like, optimize, like, processes, how to be more efficient. Mm. It's completely unrelated to what I'm doing, but I'm just really... Like very excited to learn about these kind of things, and there's no repercussions to failure, also, right? Yeah, you just yeah. keep redoing it until you pass, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's very fun. So what courses are you learning right now? Oh yeah, that that supply chain one. Supply chain, <laughs> Yeah, supply chain optimization. <laughs> Can you like just give me like top line things that is important, like like to uh, layman out there, how important is uh, optimization for processes? Like I'm not very I'm not very familiar with supply okay. chain. Okay. Um. Basically, what. Like when you let's say you buy a product online, right? Uh. And then that whole process of how it that the product gets from the factory to you, right? Mm. That's the supply chain, right? Okay. Yeah. So when you are doing when you're learning about supply chain optimization, you are thinking about how do I get this product that is correct and the fastest way possible mm. to the consumer and then the consumer is happy and the consumer mm. will continue buying. Right? Oh. So so as a marketer, we are thinking about how to sell the product. Mm. But as supply chain uh, people, right, or opti- optimizers of supply chain, right, they're trying to make sure that the, the supply chain is as smooth as it possibly can be. Mm. Yeah. So that you don't end up with the wrong product. Mm. Yeah. And a bunch of other things. So what I learned in that process is actually a lot about um, how do you how do you make things uh, go like in an efficient way and optimize like your processes like let's say uh, change it to more robotics or mm. um, cut down certain processes like try to innovate your delivery man now you don't need to to only rely on one delivery service you mm. are outsourcing freelancing like mm. just changing up the, the whole game of everything mm. yeah and I think that's just very very it just really intrigues me now like, like I'm not forced to do it again my boyfriend say I'm wasting my time but oh. like I just I just really like think it's it. It's really interesting, yeah. Mm. You you don't really think that much about oh, I ordered earphones last week, so how is it going to get to me? Mm. And how is it that the company source for like the the cheapest way to deliver to me? What mm. does free shipping mean? Mm. You know, like how, who who eats that cost? Mm. A lot of these things, yeah. So I'm like very interested to learn. I'm not the best. It's at, interesting. Like, yeah, I don't yeah. I don't feel that there's a lot of people that are very interested in this. I kind know of process, it's so right? weird. I'm no, very it's cool. strange. It's cool. It's cool to who you are, right? I learned oh. I'm very weird. I like furniture and I study supply okay. chain. <laughs> Is there a re- like for learning platforms? You talk about Coursera. Is there a mm. reason why, uh, you aren't using other platforms? Do you use Lender? Do you use Udemy? Like why why Coursera specifically? Oh, because it's free. Oh, okay, <laughs> because it's free. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you know every Singaporean has a free Lender account? Oh, is it? Do you know what Lender is? I heard about it. Lender yeah. is uh, LinkedIn Learning. Oh. You should go, go, okay, go check it out. Go check okay, it out. Okay, yeah, I'll go every check it out. Every Singaporean has a free account, so you can actually learn a lot of things from there. Oh, okay, yeah, nice, okay. nice. So changing gears, right? You you talk that you are very passionate about film in, in general. I mean, or, or theater, theater, yeah. right? Is it acting theater? Or like, how are you involved in theater? Oh, okay. So right now, uh, I'm actually writing. I I wrote a theater script. You uh, you wrote a theater. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, where do you even have the experience to write a theater script? Oh, because for? I used to work in a theater company called HCAC. Okay. So that is like an acting school in a way, uh. and that was in my final year in uni. Yeah. Mm. So I did that concurrently while I was studying. So mm. I would go in once a week to help out edit their videos and stuff. Mm. And they didn't really, they didn't pay me at all, but they pay me in classes. So if I go, let's say it's like a one-to-one exchange, right? Like you, you do two hours of work, they give you like two hours of classes, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, so I was like, okay, you know, it's very chill. Why not? Uh. And I had like, was it Wednesday free? Yeah, Wednesday free or something. Uh, so I'll just go down, help uh. out a bit. Mm. And and through that, right, I, I actually took a course called uh, script writing. Uh. Yeah, so script writing. And then uh, I wrote like a 10 page script about uh, the difficulties of getting like a BTO as a Singaporean couple. Okay, that's yeah. cool. And then that script was performed and I wasn't like the actor, I wrote it, right? So uh, it was like performed and stuff like to a very small crowd. So I was just like, oh, okay, it's kind of cute. But it's so nice to see like something you create like turn out into a production, mm. right? I think that's a satisfaction, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and what, after that, what happens? Like someone that saw it, right? They decided that, hey, no, I want that in my production. So they actually bought the rights to my play to be wow. in another production. Yeah. that's cool. That was really fun, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like was it in, was it for a bigger production outside? Oh uh, yeah yeah it was like a bit bigger but uh. it was and it, it was at Center Forty Two which is oh, like yes, a theater I know, space Bukis. yeah 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 Bukis, right, the blue so, color building correct 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 uh. yeah yeah so they 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 bought my my ten minute play as a part of a series of other plays also okay yeah yeah so that was very exciting like 
um, because I didn't really think much about it. I was just like doing this for the fun of yeah. it. And then, um, yeah, then so I have a, so I did that script about how a couple was talking about, oh, should we get a BTO? How mm. much does it cost? Like, okay, okay. Can you give a script writing 101? Is it like, oh, Arthur says, uh, is it line for line? How do you even write a script? Like just very top level. So I, Arthur I, I, says. I don't know. Like, <laughs> what? How do you write a script? Like from a very uh, lame perspective. I, I have no idea about theater. Yeah, because like my background is in film, right? So mm. I actually, like, whenever as, as a film direct, short film director, mm. I would always be the one looking through someone's script, like their story, right? Like let's oh, say ten pages. Okay. So from a director's perspective, I'm always like cutting out stuff. This one is not interesting. This one ah. expand more stuff ah. like that, right? But now, right, when I'm writing as a script writer, the challenge is is completely different because you are trying to write a story that. That has a, a proper flow to it. It's not just mean like aimlessly winding into nowhere. Yeah. So you need to have like you know beginning, middle, end. Okay, yeah, that's so the number one, is it? Yeah, yeah. Beginning, middle, end. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I got it. I got it. I must remember that. Okay, be, like you know, you have a beginning, middle, end. You must have a something that like both characters or who, however many characters they have goals. So they have motivations why they say what they say and why they say what they say. Mm. Right. Let's say now I'm like, oh, I really feel like eating McDonald's. So it's just like, what's my motivation? That is a goal. Yeah, yeah, my motivation is hunger. Mm. Yeah, so okay. motivation is hunger. Then uh, the goal is go and get McDonald's. The struggle to get that yeah, McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. So you have like the motivations and then the goal. You're like, okay. okay, I'm going to get McDonald's. But you always need to know why am I saying what I'm saying. I'm saying mm. I want McDonald's because of the hunger. Mm. So how do you... So let's say for you, right, you are not hungry. Mm. So now we are in somewhat of a conflict, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay, you are not hungry and you don't want McDonald's. Oh, I'm hungry, okay, I want okay. McDonald's. That, that's the very basics of it, right? Okay. So now now you put these two characters together and then now they are talking to one another. And I'm like, yeah, we can just buy first uh, and then blah, blah. So they'll try to, to work it out. And then their personality will also come out. Yes. Like how much I like McDonald's. Okay. And then you are like, you actually don't like fast food at all. Okay. So then it might snowball to other things. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's the fundamental like, to any story. That yeah, you yeah, you have motive. Everyone has their own motivations, their goals, right? As well as like their own like personality as to what they view certain things as. Mm. So that's why whenever you sit down with your uh, and, and envision characters, right? Uh. You always think about their story, you know, like mm. where is this person from? You know, why does this person not like fast food? Maybe his brother has obesity or something. So it's you a have- a personal thing. It all- Boys down yeah, correct. That. So, so even though like the like, let's say the top like the the motivation stuff is very top not line. as in it's not very major. You would yeah. say like whether you eat McDonald's or not, but like if your experience is that and you are so averse to the idea, then you'll be a lot more passionate about not wanting to eat that. And mm. but I will be like, you know, don't take it so seriously. It's just McDonald's. I can buy. You can go and get something else. Yeah. You know. So so that's how you you like you write characters, you mm. give them personality, you give them history, and you give them motivations and goals. Mm. Yeah, so when I was writing my theatre play, like I was very inspired by like some of the things that were happening like with me and my boyfriend when we were talking about it, you yeah. know, talking about- So you brainstormed with him, is it? No, like no, no, I didn't. It was just or based on experience. Or the kind of conversations you have with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like, okay, okay. Um, like it gives you inspiration for your script material, correct, correct. right? Yeah, I, now yeah. I'm, right now I'm in the process of writing another cool, one. Cool, what was it about? So, yeah, it's- uh, I'll so is it like social issues that things that personally affects you in a way? Yeah, I'm very yeah. interested in that. Like I'm interested to explore things about like mental illness and um family issues mm. or and and social issues also. And I make it very like Singaporean in a sense. Not all place have has to be that way. You know, mm. you can always do a comedy and not take it so seriously. Mm. But for me, I'm very passionate about wanting to tell stories that have they have like a meaning or like an impact. Like you yes. feel like it's relatable. Yes. You know, like if you are in a certain life stage where you're thinking about getting a house or you're at a certain life stage where um, you don't really know where you're going in your career, mm. all these things, right, they, they are relatable. Even if now you're like a 50-year-old man or whatever, right, you would have went through some part of that in your life. Mm. So that's why I, whenever, but my thing about my previous play is very painful to, to watch. The reason why it's painful, right, is because it was so real. Oh. And because now now you understand like the, the cost of, of the 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 relationship being on the line the BTO thing mm. because the cost of failure is so high. Yeah. Right. So that's what I was putting in my play. And then mm. it was so painful to watch because they, a lot of people understand that struggle. They're oh. like, I don't know whether my relationship is gonna work, right? We've been together for a year, right? Let's just go and get married because we need a flat. If not, we not we can't have a flat anymore. Yeah. That urgency. So I created oh. that urgency. I created oh. that situation where everybody will understand what I'm talking about. At, at least for Singaporeans, yeah. right? Yeah, so it was painful in a sense that it was real. That is really the struggle. You don't even know the person that well. You've been together a year and then mm. now you want to get a house. Oh. The cost of 
the cost of your relationship failing is like five hundred thousand uh, dollars, you know, yes, versus yes. like your endowment plan, right? The cost of failure is not five hundred thousand, you yeah. know. Yeah, so that's what I was like exploring in when, that when play. Is, when is your play being uh, oh, yeah, produced it was, again? It was produced already. It was wait, produced no, already. Wait, wait, is there an upcoming date? Oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. It's not a film <laughs> or video, right? No, 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 no. Oh, but I have the script. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> the script. Okay. I have the script. So yeah. what are you working on right now? Yeah, so right now I'm working on a on another play, mm. and it's about like exploring family issues. So mm. like about how again giving everybody certain motivations between like let's say why um the father wants you to work in like the business sector and why the mother does not want you to do that. Like mm. you can do your own artistic things, mm. and then like the the child wanting to explore these kind of things. So like that's kind of what I want to go into into my next script. But I have the I have the full skeleton of how my play is going to work out. Was but it I haven't a personal written. personal experience that you have? Not really, not yeah. Really, but not more really. of exploring social issues that yeah. everyone could relate to. Correct. It's like more of talking to people, like, and then hearing their own lived experience and like mm. how is it that their parents approach them in a negative or in a positive way, mm. and then giving people their voice because I think it's very easy to villainize people when they say you can't do this, you know, you shouldn't do this. But then mm. when you hear their history, you know why they ended up like you that. Empathize with them why they. Did yeah, what they did. and that's my goal. Like my goal is that when I'm writing an impactful story, right, is that I want. You, I want to be. I want the people who are watching it to be able to empathize with my characters, even mm. though certain things they do are not likable. Mm. Yeah, so that's what like that's what I'm trying to do in the like theater scripts that I write. Mm. So whether or not it's like showcase or whatever, it doesn't really matter lah. I think mm. it, it's just important to like just start writing creatively. Mm. That's my creative outlet lah. Because mm. let's say working is all very like numbers based. How do I convince you to buy my stuff? You yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. But then when I do like my theater stuff, and right now mm. I'm also directing a short film. It's mm. in post production. Cool. Yeah, so when is it released? Um, I think it should be next year. Yeah, okay, it's okay. With uh, leave it a future link. <laughs> <laughs> leave a future link. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's about it's called the race, and and there's this girl that is trying to figure out what does she want to do with her career and blah blah. It's with NUS uh, like so. Or oh, NUS film. Yeah, it? NUS films also. Oh, so yeah, okay. I'm still working on that project right now. I'll look. I'll be looking at a cut like next week or something. Mm. So you were the director <laughs> of this short film. Yes. How is it like being a director? Um, being a director is very, very interesting because you need to know many aspects of the film, um, film industry and, and like their roles. Okay, so let let me talk. About, let me break it down about mm. who is in the film industry and who is in your team, who is your crew, right? Because it's very easy. Your cast is your actors, oh. right? How do you like how how do you like go and find your actors and then like how much you pay them, etc., etc. So mm. actors and, and your cast, but who is in your crew? Mm. So to break it down, your in your crew you have a lighting person, you have a camera person, mm. a sound person, your producer, mm. and your like a di- assistant director. Okay, mm. so like let's say the basics of it is like five people. Mm. If every one of them has this specific role and they don't multi wear multiple hats, uh, yeah. they will have these five, and then you have production assistants also. Mm. So that'll be six. Yeah. So. In the crew, so this is not like my first short film that I've 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 directed. Like there are several others also. Some of them are like for school projects, and mm. then the other one was like my previous one, which called the eulogy. Mm. Yeah, so this one is called the race, and and every time I would do a, a film project, I will I will work with at least these basic six people. So how do you, as a director, you are the leader and you are the visionary of the story. So when your scriptwriter comes to you, right? Because now I personally don't write my the the scripts that I do. I think. There's a reason why. The reason why I don't do it is because I think it's very difficult to kill your baby. Yes, yes, yes. Right, right. Because now when I did my own theatre script, right, and I have people like like let's say some my teacher that was going through the not teacher like the mentor. coach yeah the mentor was that was helping me to edit it down. It was very very painful. It was like you're cancelling out entire yeah. pages. You're cancelling out entire paragraphs. Yeah. And then like. It, it just like what like oh my god I yeah. can't I can't like mm. it's very difficult so now I empathize a lot with the screenwriters so mm. when I'm sitting there and just like ripping it to shreds oh. you know yeah so like I really it will be if I am my own scriptwriter and director right it it wouldn't work very well I feel oh. yeah I needed to be separate and I mm. actually enjoyed when my script was in different directors hands that it actually kind of looked very different mm. yeah and and I need to know that once my script is done right I need to kill it I need to not like be in so involved in the process already because what is done is done whatever mm. I've written is complete mm. in that sense so back to directing right um, I would sit down with the script writer so let's starting from the beginning and 
beginning of how you get a short film done right until you finish your short film you show it to people right mm. it's a pretty long process so going to the beginning right you're sitting down with your script writer and then you ask a script writer what is the story you want to tell mm. right so they will give you like a brief you know like maybe like one two sentences and then i will hear several like, i'll be like okay i'm interested in this idea i'm not interested in another so let's say you come to me with the idea how, like, how honest are you Oh, I'm very very honest. Very honest, yeah, oh, yeah. Isn't it painful for the scriptwriter? Yeah, so that's why I have to have a decent relationship with oh, okay, like okay. the scriptwriters. They need to trust that I'm trying to help them. Oh. So if you tell me fundamentally your story is about this girl trying to like struggling to to find out where's her career going to take her, blah blah blah. So fundamentally, you have like like the heart of it. Okay, mm. as long as at the end of the day, right, I'm showing the heart of it, right, to to viewers, right, that that will make the scriptwriter happy because mm. your goals are aligned. Because mm. I understand what you're trying to do. I'm trying to help you visualize that. It's just the means of delivery in translating that into film. Yeah, that correct. is the director's role. Yeah, and also like when your your let's say your speech is way too long uh. and you ramble too much about this From is a this. Camera's perspective, oh, yeah, well, I need to you need to think about all such. Yeah, yeah, but that's later on. Uh. So cutting down the script is one thing, making it condensed, making it impactful. Mm. Yeah. So that so that was the initial stages where you sit down with your scriptwriter and you sit down with your producer. So, so your producer is the one that does everything, man. Like, like gets the people there, what yeah. venue, the right the props correct, correct. and everything, what clothes they wear, makeup or yeah, logistically they it's are the really mastermind, yeah. Yeah, heads of the producers. Yeah, they are the biggest people in the industry for a reason, but yeah. they don't get much credit. Yeah, yeah. it's the directors. Uh, yeah, the, it's always the big shot. Editors don't get the credit. Yeah, I don't exactly. know why. Like, like, if you talk about Avatar and like stuff like that, whoa, man, yeah. the amount of work that uh, the post production yeah, team has to do, it's, crazy, it's insane. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, um, so that's the initial stage. So we kind of try to figure out what it is that you want in your script and mm. how you're gonna, uh, how am I gonna help you, uh, deliver that in the final film. Mm. And, and so that, that entails you understanding a bit about uh, what does a scriptwriter does. So, so that one I already know. And also I understand what the producer does. So it's always good to, to know a bit of every single thing. So you know a bit about lighting, you know a bit about producing, you know a bit about all of this. You don't need to be an expert. Nobody expects you to be in a student production, right? Definitely not. Mm. But you need to know so that you can communicate with people and, mm. and they can help you achieve what you want. So for example, let's say now we're on set, everybody's there. Okay, and and now you are looking at it and you are thinking, this is what is looking at is too dark. You wouldn't exactly like just be like, oh, it's too dark. I don't like it. So you're not giving specific instructions. You need to give specific instructions like, um, can I have some soft lighting there to light up the subject's face? Is yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like uh, the focus. So you tell the lighting right. You go to the person and say, okay, the focus should be on this person. She's the main, the main person. Can I have like focus lighting on here? The environment is too warm. I want cool lighting. Oh, okay. Stuff that, like that. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so, so specific. So sound right. And then sound they will also be waiting for you to give them their cue. So it's like mm. I want her flipping the pages. So you, I you want you to, that, that you need to get that sound there. And then after that, I also want her when she stands up to be walking out. So mm. so you give them specific to what their role is entail. You won't tell the sound person I want warm lighting, right? It's yeah. irrelevant. You make their life easy by telling them what you need. Yeah. As simple as that. As yeah. simple as that. And also that means that you need to know also. You cannot just be like, uh, so record the sound of this person. Uh, okay. And, and then, then the person yeah, like, it needs to be more specific. Yeah, yeah. It, it will be a, two, a conversation between two people. So I need you to capture the, the mics. Okay? Correct. For no, no, no technical people, there's a lot of technicalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. But like, like let's say, yeah, yeah. So, so you just tell, don't tell them how to do their job. It's another thing. Mm. Tell them what you want, they will do it for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you say, the, the person will be flipping the pages. I want that. I want the sound of flipping pages. You don't need to tell them, here's how you hold the mic. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in terms of the, like, the macro lessons when it comes to being a director or in life, like, being a director to general lessons what what are the kind of traits have you learned as a director which I, are helpful in your professional or just personal life in general i think what i learned as a director is to always know a bit about what that person does oh okay. yeah so you might not be the best person in the entire room or like the the most like the smartest or like have the greatest specialization whatever it is mm. right you might always be talking about talking to people that know more than you mm. so really it's it's like in the initial stages it's a, a lot about learning like you know go there very humble like trying to figure out what is it you do you know like mm. and then like how, how am I supposed to bring all these people together mm. and then make a coherent storyline mm. yeah so 
that's a lot of like the responsibility lies on the director to to do that as a whole and the mm. and the responsibility of how everything runs smoothly lies on the producer mm. so the director and producers really need to communicate very well so mm. yeah so and, and also working under pressure because it's in it's crazy you know you can yeah. be like working until like let's say like 1 2 a.m before mm. you wrap up when you're supposed to end at like 10 yeah the time crunch is really real like you're paying actors only for Correct. a certain duration of time yeah. you need that shot and if you don't have that shot what do you do? That's and a lot yeah, of yeah. That, so it's a lot of uh, there can be a lot of tension, and it's also like trying to figure out how to communicate when you're under so much pressure. Mm. Yeah, and if you're talking about it on a bigger stage, right, like Hollywood or something, right? Yeah, I do, Every I, hour, I like yeah, every hour of your actor's time you're taking, right, you need to pay them. Yeah. Right. So so that's why directors and producers they're always fighting one mm. because the director wants to have a good film, the producer uh, wants it to be not so expensive. Money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> budget, budget, please, please. Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so ending of this podcast, right? I just have two generic questions for okay, you. Okay, right? yes. For anyone who is a young university student, perhaps in English literature, have a who has a slight interest in the media industry in general, what would you say to him or her? I would say just do a bunch of internships. Or do a bunch of internships, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're saying like the school uh, curriculum is not very helpful in that sense. Oh uh, yeah, it? it's totally not. It's totally useless, is it? Oh uh, yeah, the school <laughs> curriculum does nothing for you. <laughs> no, no. Actually, that's, no, that's my opinion as well, actually. I don't feel like I have learned any... I mean, in a macro sense, yes, I do understand how businesses work, but in terms of like the groundwork, especially in the media industry. So, advice is get your hands dirty. <laughs> no, okay, so... Going back, revising what I said. <laughs> okay, okay. After and you need, come for me, don't give me funding. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, okay. so um, I would say do a bunch of internships and uh, just explore a lot more and like and do do like different CCAs that you have never done before, oh. all that kind of thing. Just explore while you're in university because you have the room mm. to fail. Mm. Yeah, so even while I was in uni, I also wrote stuff for like Nusu the Rich, oh. like our magazine. Mm. I did the film thing. Mm. I did like rock climbing, like a bunch of random things. Mm. But it's like just make sure you get the most out of your university education because yeah. it's not just studying because yes. if you just bunker down and study for four years it's not going to do you any good yeah. you're going to come out with the same piece of paper everyone else has yes what makes you different mm. you know and what makes you different is going to be what you do with your time or your dad that others did not mm. and that would that would be what differentiates you even if mm. it's an internship even if it's like a part-time thing at a company or whatever mm. it is just do it don't care the company small the company big don't don't overthink the like your internships mm. I, I would say that because some people will be like oh this this name is not a very big name I don't mm. think I'll get much out of it do something compared to do nothing yeah. just do, do things just do something mm. yeah and and it will definitely show when you are like talking to people then mm. then you are a much better conversationalist also because mm. then you have something to bring to the mm. table if not, uh, I, I studied for four years Uh, yeah the modules were uh, end of story. You and don't I, want I that can to happen, write well. Is it? Like, you know, oh, like yeah, yeah, everybody in a, everybody with us degree can write well. Like, you mm. know, you wouldn't be where you are if you cannot write decently, right? Mm. So it that's that's not something that specializes you from from anyone. Uh. And I think oh another advice is that um don't if if what you plan on doing with your career in the beginning changes when you're year four, right? Don't let it get to you that much because like, it really got to me like in the beginning it was like I really so much wanted to be like a journalist and stuff mm. but then when I hit year 4 I realized I didn't want it now I'm just like what have I been doing Things in my change, life right? yeah so don't beat yourself up too much about it mm. and don't think that your experience doesn't count either because for me I, I always felt like I have a very weird like array of stuff that I did, I did I think in my all life. of us are weird in our certain ways yeah. like, we need to celebrate that like. Yeah, and, and, and your employers also will see like things about you that are unique that other people don't have and it mm. might not even be related to what you're gonna be doing also, mm. right? Yeah, so that's why um that's why just like explore that and, and just try because you won't know until you try and fail. Yeah. Last question. If one year from now it was the best year of your life, what would need to happen to make it the best year from your of your life one year from now? But this year is already the best year. Of okay, my yeah. Life. Okay, so if this year is the best year of your life, what would need to happen to you to make it the best year of your life to beat this year, one year from now? Sounds like a mouthful. <laughs> Sounds like a mouth. So basically, what do I want to do next year? No, yeah. What no? <laughs> what things would need to happen for it to make it the best year of your life next year? I'm no, just curious. Nothing. Nothing much. No, nothing, really. nothing much. Yeah. Okay. I'm incredibly like content. Okay. No, that's okay. First, before I, I answer that, right, you I really would have to like 
fix my goals because mm. like the beginning of this year the reason why it was such a fulfilling year right is because I actually achieved all of my new year's resolution mm-hmm. every single one of them mm. so be it family goals uh, financial goals all of it right I've, I've achieved it so it's, it takes time and it takes a lot of patience it's like it's not magical let's say next year I'm going to get $10,000 or something oh. right um, then, then that will make me that will be the best year of my life mm. um, yeah so every year before this right has been like the best year then next one is the best year then next one is the best year yes. so it piles on top and and it I feel like it happens this way because every year when I write down my goals right I have actions in place as to how I'm going to achieve it mm. yeah so there are like the small goals and there are like the big goals mm. so the, what needs to happen next year is really not much at all. It's just like to focus more on like my career and like mm. building my relationship, like focusing on family, mm. all that. And finding out now that I've known what's my priorities, right? And mm. what I really want from life. I mm. think every year after this is just going to be a good year. Mm. Yeah. So a lot of personal growth and a lot of oh. just like being content. Yeah. Okay, Renee, thanks so much for coming, man. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> and uh, for context of that, she came all the way from the west of Singapore. <laughs> this is the like next to Changi Prison, which is the east, right? <laughs> yeah. For those listeners that want to keep in touch with you or just uh, just send you a message in general, how can they keep uh, get your contact? LinkedIn. <laughs> just LinkedIn, right? LinkedIn yeah. really changes lives. Thanks so much. Okay. Yay. Bye.